Okay, so I'd now like to introduce Rob Strayer, who's the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Information Industry Council, and he's going to moderate this panel. Great. Thanks, Susan, uh, and thank you to uh, all the GW staff who put this wonderful uh, conference together over the last two days. So welcome to this afternoon's panel on extended reality and the implications for national security. Uh, in the room today, we have uh, Everyone's full bio is on, on the website and the printed materials. Uh, but with us in the room today, we have Colonel Jim Hangalinen uh, with the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command, the TRADOC, and he is the director of their office that's focused on synthetic training. Uh, next to me here is Jennifer McCardle. Uh, Jennifer is the head of research at Improbable U.S. Defense and Security. And she's also an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. And we have two of our panelists joining us online. Uh, the first is Chris Kremitas Courtney. Chris is currently serving as a senior fellow at the Friends of Europe and is a lecturer for the Institute for Security Governance. Also joining us online is John P. Grant with the Academy for Defense Intelligence. Since 2015, John has been leading something called the Virtual Worlds Forum, which helps identify extended reality <coughs> capabilities for the United States government. Um, as in the other panels, we're going to reserve time at the end for uh, questions of the audience that's here and the audience online. Uh, in the first 40 minutes, we're going to break that into roughly three parts. The first is going to be identifying ways in which uh, extended reality can contribute and enhance uh, national security. Uh, we're also going to follow that with a discussion briefly of policy issues related to the investment in extended reality. And then we'll turn to questions about the implications or challenges for national security related to extended reality. And then we'll turn to our uh, audience questions. So um, to kick things off, I'd like to turn to John Grant online. Uh, John, we, we talked uh, briefly before we did this panel about having a general definition of uh, what, what extended reality means as well as the meta, a metaverse. And I also wanted to see if you could give us a further definition of, is there a particular way to define the metaverse related to national security. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, so the metaverse and XR and, uh, and national security, what is the metaverse generally? Uh, you've heard a variety of, uh, throughout this, uh, this conference, a variety of explanation of what the metaverse is. Um, Alvin, during the, uh, the lunch break, mentioned basically it's a uh, evolution of the internet. In his, in his thoughts. Well, if it's an evolution of the internet, then I, I would term that as the internet averse, right? It's the way that you're going to, right now on the internet, you're on the internet. The metaverse generally gives the opportunity for a user to be in uh, the internet averse or in that location, basically the feeling of presence in that uh, experience. Um, so if, if, if I'm on the, the internet and typing in a way, I'm seeing things on a flat screen um, and my, my subconscious might not kick in the way that, uh, that uh, it would if all of a sudden I have a device on my head or my eyes are seeing a, a different environment that's provided to me digitally and the feeling of presence is forcing me to interact with that content in a way that I feel like I'm there. So if somebody asks me later on, what were you doing that day at that time? Um, if I was inside a metaverse or inside an immersive application where I was embodied as something and interacting with certain content, my subconscious would have thought I was in that location, even though consciously I knew I was physically potentially in my room, in a classroom, wherever that is. But when it comes to training, um, that opportunity to, to leverage and pull that immersion and that feeling of presence becomes easier to, uh, to work the process of uh, education, teaching people certain things, getting them exposed to it. Um, so really it's the, just the, for us, it's just this difference between being uh, on something and being in something and feeling the presence there and how that changes your experience. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John. I think it's a perfect segue into uh, Colonel Colonel 
kind of lean in. Uh, Jim, you've come here from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to demo some X, XR uh, for people here at the conference. Uh, and you're also using that in your day-to-day -day work there. So just wonder if you could give the, the audience a sense of the ways that the U.S. military is able to use XR today in ways that we might be able to use it in the future. Hey, thanks. Yes, I come from the Combined Arms Center where we're, where we're responsible for developing the platforms and strategies from which we build Army training readiness for the force. We're also responsible for the education of soldiers at, at any grade point or rank. So one of the areas that we are currently investigating and investing on across the Army is the use of these technologies to enhance the way that we currently do Army training. The Army has long recognized the efficacy of simulations, digital simulations in building training readiness. So we have for over four decades invested in different types of simulators, everything from tank simulators to helicopter simulators to rifle marksmanship capabilities, all the way up to digital war gaming platforms where we can train our highest echelons across the Army. One of the areas that we are currently investing in is called the Integrated Visual Augmentation System. This is a system called the IVAS. You may have read some articles about this capability. And this is a soldier mounted heads up display for actual army soldiers on the ground in co combat operations anywhere in the world to augment those soldiers with AR technologies that provide them with a, a competitive edge on the battlefield against our adversaries. This IVAS capability, which begins fielding shortly, is still in development, but it's going to expand the way that we bring these technologies to the, to the battle space, again, to give our soldiers that competitive edge. With this IVAS capability, if you can imagine a wearable device that integrates with the soldier's body armor, that provides digital information to that soldier that would be unavailable if, it, if that soldier was not wearing the technology. It includes a night vision capability. It includes a squad radio and it has the ability to pull up three-dimensional holograms that enables a soldier to see map data. It provides a global positioning system that shows that soldier's positioning anywhere in the world down to 10, uh, 10 digits of a 10-digit grid. It's a pretty incredible capability. We've long recognized how we can improve the combat effectiveness and the survivability of a soldier by enhancing that soldier on the battlefield with these kinds of capabilities. If you look back through just recent history, look at the, the difference between a soldier that did not have night vision devices in, you know, up to the Vietnam era, and then the introduction of this digital device enhanced the, the, not, not only the soldier's effectiveness on the battlefield, but it totally changed the American way of war. We went from an army that fought in the day to an army that you saw in 1991 fully own the night and fight almost exclusively in the night. Similarly, you look at GPS and what that did, the augmentation of soldiers, the precision, the precision navigation and timing, the ability to use precision munitions, fundamentally change the way that we operate. The same will probably, we believe, will occur with the inclusion of AR capabilities augmented to the soldier to provide those combat uh, effectiveness. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Jenny, you're at a company that's, uh, you're a senior role at a company that's providing this type of technology to the U.S. government. Could you comment on the ways that, that um, these applications are developing and overall how you rate the state of the defense metaverse today? So I guess, I guess to start, when we think about the applications of these technologies to national security, it makes sense to start to first think about how are we defining national security? So are, are we defining it in a narrow context, in which case, you know, the ability of the armed forces to defend the sovereignty of our nation. And I think Jim was really getting at a lot of those application areas, whether that's for test or training or experimentation, even acquisition. Um, and then I know some panelists yesterday talked a bit about morale issues, like using it for post-traumatic stress disorder, or you can even use it for sexual harassment training in the military, and it happens today. But then there's this broader definition of national security, and that comes to, you know, thinking about the safekeeping of our nation as a whole, 
And there's a lot of applications for these tools within that space as well. So that's when you get into things like pandemics, natural disasters. And right now we're using, um, we're using these kind of modeling and simulation tools, synthetic environments. And even we're starting to think about using XR tools for saying pandemic modeling. We used a lot of that during the pandemic for COVID. Um, we've started modeling the effects of natural disasters. The Navy's very concerned about this because it has implications for where they station their bases. Um, in the intelligence community, there's a lot of questions on population and how, what is a normal pattern of life and given say age of operations. So we're starting to model populations so that we can understand say what disinformation does to that population. So there's tons of applications for this um, from a national security perspective. In terms of the state of technology, I'd say it's mixed. Um, we have been using, in the, in the national security community, we have been using simulators since World War II with the link trainer. When you look at distributed simulation, the first distributed simulation that was fundamentally powerful was SimNet, I mean, simulator networking. It came out in the 90s. Basically, we were linking multiple tank simulators together to a distributed architecture. So there's things that have been developed, quite frankly, it's been quite incremental since the 90s that are quite powerful. We have networks that allow us to conduct distributed simulation. We're able to conduct what we would call distributed live virtual and constructive training. So this is when you're linking a live, say, aircraft with a virtual and constructive simulation. We can do that, say, linking Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada with Air Force's base like Misawa uh, in Japan. So we can do all sorts of stuff in these simulated environments. And we would expect as these technologies develop, for instance, like gaming technologies, that we'll be able to push the limit even more within the military. I think a lot of it comes down to not the technology itself, but com the comfort level of these tools within the military and the comfort level from an adoption standpoint, which is why I think the work that Jim and his team are doing is quite frankly, really powerful because it's hard to understand why we should adopt these tools unless you're actually interacting with them. So having SWAT teams like Jim's group of people showing generals within the military how powerful these can be from a battlefield effectiveness and um, a preparedness standpoint, is it's, it's a, an amazing thing. Great. Uh, Chris, I'm now going to come to you uh, overseas, joining us from uh, Greece. Um, Jim, uh, Chris, I know that um, you've had some recent experience picking up on the same thing that uh, Jenny was just mentioning of ways that the metaverse and simulation can help integrate uh, policymakers in the way that they're thinking about things, even though they're in different locations. Um, I just wonder if you could give us some examples of how that's currently being done. And I know you have the firsthand experience being part of that as well. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. I, uh, we recently ran it at our uh, Friends of Europe at our think tank in Brussels. We run a EU NATO private sector hybrid threats exercise, uh, tabletop exercise every year. And this year we set that exercise, we set that scenario in the year 2030, and we involved a number of emerging uh, and uh, disruptive technologies, among them XR and, and the, uh, you know, what would XR look like in 2030? Uh, and so we, yeah, that was, a, uh, that's the only application I have. We didn't use XR to do it, but we, XR was part of the scenario. Uh, and I can talk a bit more about that. Would you like me to talk about that now or later? Go ahead now. Okay. Um, well, a few things. One was, you know, looking at our main concern, uh, the main concern we had of our private sector players, uh, civil society, EU, NATO, and national government players was, uh, you know, looking at the X XR and the metaverse, uh, and, you know, or metaverse says, which, you know, if we look in the future, you know, there'll be many uh, globally as a more uh, precise and potent delivery means for disinformation. Uh, so that was, you know, one concern. The other one is, you know, looking at some of the, even without disinformation, looking at some of the deeper societal divisions due to an emerging split of society based on differing uh, forms of reality. I mean, look at what, where we are today with interactive media. I mean, I think Alvin pointed it out very well earlier that you know, we, have, we spend about 11 hours a day using these devices. In the future, we're looking at 14, 16 plus hours per day immersed. Uh, and what does, how more, much more potent is disinformation in an immersive environment? And what does that mean? I think one important thing that we, we looked at was that, you know, will in, in that kind of information landscape, if you don't govern it right uh, and you don't have the right 
have a population that's prepared for an immersive future, that reality may no longer be a single objectively verifiable perspective. And what does that mean? You know, what does that mean for social cohesion and democracy? And the reason that is, is such a concern is that in just the last few years, we've seen a lot of disinformation driven uh, violent extremism. We saw it on January 6th. We saw it in, uh, in Berlin in 2020. They attempted to storm the Bundestag. We saw it in the storming of the Brazilian Supreme Court in September 21. We've had here in Europe, in Europe we've had over 300 uh, 5G towers attacked and burned down because people are afraid that Bill Gates is going to shoot a chip into their neck and control them, right? Or, or put it in the vaccine. So, you know, people believing disinformation to the degree that they're willing to take action. No kidding. Um, and so this was, you know, the big thing we looked at from that perspective, the consensus we reached was, you know, looking at a future meta, future metaverses as an ungoverned or undergoverned space that we need to get a handle on how to govern it. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and we can cover more of this later. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, no, I'd like to go back to you, John. I know you've got a long history with the Defense Intelligence Agency and you know, it's a common doctrine that uh, the United States never wants to be in a fair fight with an adversary based on technology. We always want to have an overmatch advantage without the technology that we have. So when it comes to XR, uh, do you see that, that uh, we will go down a path at some point of a competition, an arms race, if you will, of XR in the, in the capabilities that we want to have uh, for the United States? Well, I would say in the, in the, in the spirit of competition, if you don't know uh, the technology, you can't compete, right? So uh, for us in the intelligence community and DOD, gaining a better understanding of what those capabilities are, not just from our science and technology endeavors, but our workforce, really to understand where those technologies are, where they're moving, and do we have an impact on that? Do we have an impact on it with our industry? Um, and how do we collaborate uh, and coordinate some of those efforts um, to get some of our senior leaders better knowledgeable on those. You think about what the, you know, the existence of the House Reality Caucus in the U.S. Congress. Um, how well is that uh, caucus syncing with the, with what DOD and the U.S. government's understanding of what XR is today and what it'll look like, not in 20 years, but what it'll look like in eight years uh, and how impactful that will be to every day life and our process for uh, recruiting people into the government and into the military, because do we have a version of the internet averse, the metaverse that uh, drives interest in coming and working with the government? Uh, because in eight years, how many high school students uh, in the United States are gonna be leveraging these type of capabilities to enhance their education. And then going on to colleges and universities and other academic institutions that provide a version of some type of educational verse that enhances their, their ability to learn the thing they want and get out into the workforce quicker. And do we offer something like that in the federal government? So it, for, for us in your question, it comes down to you can't compete unless you understand it. And you have to, in order to understand it, you have to go and uh, gain a bit. You have to put the workforce moving in that direction. Um, we play a little bit of that uh, with our virtual worlds form in pulling together these action officers from across the US government to better understand on a regular basis where, that, where those capabilities are, what they mean, and then it helped them that workforce help them expose to their uh, workforce the capabilities to really help drive requirements. Because we've had plenty of leaders that have seen great demonstrations and great capabilities and come back to their organization and say, hey, I wanna adopt this or I wanna try this. And it gets lost in the middle someplace. And it doesn't get, nothing gets adopted because there's, no, there's not enough of a push and there's not enough of a, um, I would say, a resource obligation to address it. Um, we've got a POM cycle that 
doesn't fit very well with the rapid uh, movement of this technology and these capabilities. Great. No, th thanks a lot, John. I'm now going to go to uh, Jenny, then Jim, and then Chris, who was also seen nodding online. Just want you all to sort of address that, that kind of key question of how to make leadership aware in the you know, political leadership or leadership in uh, military institutions or the intelligence community about the benefits and then how we can insert the, the need to have budget items identified and, and dollars put against these capability developments that need to occur over time. Uh, and I think you all have a, each have a different perspective on how that should best be done. So I'll start with the, the person on the, in the private sector side, Jenny. So I actually wanted to uh, go back to the original question on whether there might be a competition or like an arms race towards the metaverse. And I'd offer this. Um, we oftentimes think of technology as a thing that's going to give us an edge in conflict. But in the defense literature, we talk about revolutions in military affairs. And it's not technology that gives you an edge in conflict. It's how you organizationally and operationally innovate around that technology. So if we look backwards and you think of past armies in the past, you can look at, say, nuclear weapons or um, you know, Blitzkrieg. War, uh, Blitzkrieg. So, the Germans weren't the first adopter of tanks. It was the British and the French. It was the way they operationally and organizationally innovated around those tanks that made them fundamentally powerful in World War II and pushed through the Ardennes the way they did. So when we think about a metaverse or the metaverse, we need to think about it as an enabler. So what is it enabling? It can enable better training, better types of acquisitions, quicker acquisitions, more efficient acquisitions, best, better tests and evaluation. So we should be thinking about how we can use that to cause a paradigm shift in the way we approach training, the way we approach experimentation, so we can think more creatively about what our future force should look like. Think better, like think about how we can fundamentally change our acquisition structure based on using these tools that are fundamentally enablers. So I wouldn't say that there's going to be an arms race for this. I'd say like, how do we think about using these tools and operationally and organizationally integrate around them to make them fundamentally powerful so that we are better in future competition and conflict? Great, thanks. Uh, Jim, I, I mean, you've been working in this area for some years now. Uh, do you have any, you know, while it's still nascent, do you have this field? Do you have uh, any lessons learned for, you know, identifying requirements and capabilities and getting those built into budget cycles? Yes, definitely. Uh, to, to address the initial yeah. question, though, is, yeah. is the, if the U.S. military decides to invest in XR technology for use in operations around the world, will that, will that start some kind of XR arms race and the militarization of this technology? I, I don't know the answer to that is. <clears throat> People are asking questions, and good questions, these are policymakers and leaders uh, across, across the military, of what is the cost of investing in, in these technologies? And then we have to balance those costs against other modernization priorities in a, in a, a budget-constrained environment. That's a good question of what is the cost of this. I think the scarier question, or the question that's not asked enough is, what is the cost of not investing in these technologies? And I mean in the future. And I think that cost can be measured in soldiers' lives on the battlefield. If you look at the lessons that we're already starting to learn from the current war in Ukraine, and in the use of commercial off-the-shelf technologies to gain competitive advantages against adversaries on the battlefield, it's pretty clear. Or if you go back, if that's a little too recent, then maybe you can go back to the 2020 uh, Second Nagorno-Karabakh War, where, where commercial off-the-shelf technologies was used in a way to transform the landscape of the battle space, to transform the lethality and the interconnectedness of this battle space. So certainly, if the U.S. government decides to heavily invest in these technologies, then we can expect our, our competitors to do so. But I believe that this is already happening. As a, so I can speak as a, just an American soldier with 26 years of service, but I can also speak as a taxpayer and as a father of a son who's a, who was a, a soldier, um, served in Afghanistan. He's, he's out of the Army now, but he's a disabled combat veteran. And as a just an American taxpayer and father of, of, of you know as a a, a father who uh, allowed you know my family's treasure to, to be a part of this uh, of, of, of national defense, I can say that we almost have an obligation to do everything we can to give our soldiers a competitive edge in the battle space. The second part of your question is what are we doing now? Um, and 
I, I do want to talk to you about the synthetic training environment. The, and, and we are in the process now of introducing a fundamental modernization of how the Army conducts training, and specifically how we conduct digital training. Uh, this gets to a comment that Dr. McCarl just made about live, virtual, and constructive training. And what we come to realize is that the demands of this complex modern battle space requires a different methodology for training. Currently, we are training in those three environments, live, virtual, and constructive. But the way that we do so is stovepiped. Those environments rarely touch each other. In other words, you have soldiers that are conducting live training out in the field somewhere, maybe shooting live ammunition. And then you have soldiers that are conducting virtual training on simulators. And those, those um, environments of training are not connected. Uh, Jenny has written extensively on this, but I think the U.S. Department of Defense has acknowledged the fact that live virtual constructive training is the, is the way of the future to build training readiness across the joint force. And it is a synergy of those, of those environments. So the Army has embarked on this thing called the synthetic training environment to unify these, until recently, unconnected bins of training so that we can conduct distributed training around the world all on a single in a single virtual scenario we can have a platoon of soldiers conducting training on tank simulators connected to maybe a company of infantry conducting live training connected to a higher headquarters somewhere outside of the united states and they are all in one unified synthetic training environment so when you if you read about the army's efforts, this modernization priority called the SEE, what you'll find is that we are investing in the Army's future in training readiness, that we're trying to right some of the problems of the past, where we have, a sense, in a sense, gone after individual training capabilities. We've partnered with industry, and they have created a capability that meets a need, but it usually will be a bespoke system with proprietary software that just doesn't talk to anything else. So then we end up with scores of training capabilities that simply don't interrupt and interoperate. The synthetic training environment will, 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 um, will end that cycle by creating a single, a single software platform that runs all of our simulators, a single train database that unifies 56 disparate train um, map data, uh, databases into a single, all of the planet Earth into a single capability called One World Terrain and a single set of tools by which any soldier can get into this synthetic training environment. <laughs> and uh, this is coming soon, this capability and that IVAS capability I mentioned earlier. Great, that's that's very helpful to have that kind of understanding of the need for interoperability and the comprehensive nature of it. And just as a quick aside, thank you for your continued service and service of your, your son. Um, Chris, I wanted to go back to you overseas. Um, I just wanted to know if you have any observations you could share about the way that you see governments outside US government investing in extended reality for national security purposes? Well, first of all, I think just to back up one thing from earlier, and that is all technology is military technology. And there's no, you know, there's, you know, people can talk about dual use, but, you know, as we're, as we're seeing in, in Ukraine, and we've seen elsewhere is any, you can pick it up and use it to win, uh, you're going to do it. And I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a choice for the United States or, or, or Europe or anyone. But I think the really tough thing right now is, you know, when we look at all where the investments go, we've got artificial intelligence and all those applications. We've got quantum computing and, and before that quantum resistant cryptography to protect all these systems well before, you know, someone reaches quantum supremacy. We've got additive manufacturing. So where XR fits into all of these priorities, I think, and you know, especially if they're integrated, you know, the AI and XR where those are integrated and protected by quantum resistant cryptography, you know, I think you have some synergy there, but I think that's the tough thing right now for uh, senior decision makers and budgeteers is how much do you invest where on what? Because it's it's incredibly tough to know where to put that put those dollars or euros right now. Um, and and early, to your earlier question about you know looking to the future and how do you how do you get senior uh, political leaders and others to pay attention to these things? That's why we did our exercise a few weeks ago. <laughs> that's why we put that set in the future to force them to look at. What's ahead of them? What's on that road ahead of them? What what exits are there on that I ninety five in the future? You know, so you don't blow on past it and miss a decision point. You should have, you know, on something you should have made a decision about for how to govern it, how to spend money on it, 
what to invest in, where to collaborate. You know, the, the big issue in Europe usually is, you know, they want to buy European, but it's hard to do that if the, you know, if the technology or the capability to produce it doesn't exist here. That, that's one thing. But another thing I would I'd point out, and I'm glad that Jim brought this up, um, and that is, you know, if we think about a future in which a lot of global society and a lot of the global economy is, is occurring inside the metaverse, you know, what, 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 what does that mean for borders? How do we police in there? Who, who has jurisdiction in there? And I, when I take that and look at how many activities will happen in there, how much of the global economy, what kind of damage can be done in there? And I look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, not just within Ukraine, but how the rest of the world is, how, how private actors and hyper-empowered individuals, very tech-savvy individuals are having an influence on what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Moscow and elsewhere. And I, I take that, you know, these private actors and hyper-empowered individuals and look at what does that mean for state power uh, within the metaverse and not, you know, look what's happening today, you know, uh, who, who brought back the, the internet to Ukraine? It wasn't a government actor. It was, it, was a, it was a private actor who did that, right? So what does that mean in particular uh, within the metaverse? What, will we have these, these private actors and hyper-empowered individuals? Um, what kind of power and influence will they have within that in a way that maybe we're not used to? We're used to, you know, we're all, I, I retired army myself. We're used to being state actors. We're used to being having the power and the authority uh, to do these things. But I think we're entering a world in which there's a bit of rebalancing where it looks a little more like the 1600s in Italy where you had sort of proxies, um, you know, switching sides and you had these sort of private armies and private individuals shifting power. Um, I think that take that apply that dynamic we're seeing today, marching into the future. And what does that look like in there? I think that's an important question we'll need to answer. Um, John, I'd like to go back to you. Um, and now I'd like to move our discussion a little bit more to the uh, potential security challenges posed by extended reality. Um, but what, what, what is on the top of your list is of, of vulnerabilities or challenges that we're going to see from extended reality to national security? Uh, well, the, the process of observing people in the real world uh, and people adjusting to extended reality and being in a metaverse, an internetiverse, a defense verse, or whatever that is, um, means that changes in the way people are observed uh, is, has to be taken into account, uh, both from our side and from uh, our, any of our partner sides and our adversaries. They've gotta be thinking about the, the same thing. Um, <clears throat> For us, how do we go through this process of, um, you know, spending the time to train what we've traditionally, the methods we've traditionally used to, to train, now leveraging these capabilities to enhance that process um, might reduce our operational signature. In us doing that, that's going to be the same thing for any of our adversaries as well. We've got to take into, that into account. Um, there, there are plenty, right? And I, I come back to, if we don't understand it, um, we're not gonna understand all of the security implications. But traditionally, it's digital technology. So the things that we are seeing right now with cyber security is gonna impact it. Um, but because now we're gonna give the opportunity to see people's eyes to, um, to potentially give them information in their ears at the same time as what they're seeing. Now we have to take into account what are some of the other emotional things that are gonna happen because um, actors are going to leverage these technologies um, to provide information that uh, we wouldn't have absorbed the, right, the same way with, that, with a certain impact uh, in, in traditional means, just flat screen uh, means. Um, and so that the growing of an emotional response to a situation uh, is going to be important to pay attention to because, uh, as I said before, your subconscious is involved when you're immersed. And if somebody's showing you something that you're going to get emotionally engaged in, then uh, the response is a lot different than just texting and, you know, somebody angrily texting something where they're disembodied from the actual uh, activity. 
to the point of their response being still a response where they get in somebody's face and it's still inside virtual reality. Um, how do you how do you observe that? How do you manage that? And I think uh, in one of the earlier uh, panel discussions, there was the the discussion about who's going to be the police, right? Who's going to be the the police internally for us? Who's going to be the police in each of these uh, environments? And then what is that? What is how do you relate to that legally, right? Uh, hey, you got in my face, and instead of me threatening you and saying I wanted to threaten you, I've I did it, and I had a physical reaction to that, and I felt like you had physically um, attacked me, not just tweeted to me. And how does how do I deal with that as a um, as uh, you know legally? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll let others uh, address that, and I'll and I'll follow up from there. Great, thanks, uh, Jenny. I'd like to turn to you and just. Uh maybe unpacking a little bit, one thing that John did mention just there was on cybersecurity. How is the cybersecurity landscape different? Uh, how is the vulnerability picture different when it comes to uh, extended reality? So I think the best way to think about extended reality or the metaverse and you know, cyber risks associated with it is probably to think about the internet. So we should think about it from a vulnerability standpoint. Uh, we're not going to be weaponizing the metaverse from a cyber standpoint. In defense circles, we talk about the cyber capability vulnerability paradox. So the more capable a system is, the more complex it is, and it, the more vulnerable it is. But that doesn't mean we don't want to be able to procure it. It just means that we have to be aware of that from, say, an information assurance standpoint or a risk mitigation standpoint. So when it comes to the metaverse or a metaverse, obviously the defense community wants to take advantage of it. We, are, we obviously see it as this very powerful enabler from a battlefield effectiveness standpoint. But of course, with any complex system, and we went through that full stack of capabilities yesterday, whether it's the, you know, the interface to that kind of visualization layer, the content ecosystem, you know, networking, the runtime infrastructure, every single layer in that stack, including say blockchain, if we're talking about commercial metaverses or hosting, every single layer can be exploited from a cyber standpoint. So as we design these systems, we need to be thinking about that, and some of the other panelists um, earlier really addressed this from a risk mitigation standpoint. So how do we design in security from the start? But then it's not just like it's not just information assurance. Say if we look at our most some of our most exquisite platforms in the military, like the F-35, if we only look at it from an information assurance standpoint, we're screwed, quite frankly. We need to be figuring out ways to use these platforms and train our warfighters to use them where they start to recognize, say, when that system is sabotaged, subverted. Um, or whether it's being used by a foreign actor for the purposes of espionage. And that requires also a different way of um, thinking about training. So for instance, in the military, there's this big push now to talk about degradation, dominance, and conflict. It's this belief that no matter what, we're going to be fighting in conflicts where that battle space will be subverted and, um, by foreign actors where they will be working, working to deceive those systems. So how do we change training so that they operate in a way where they understand that they, they have to operate in that kind of degraded environment. So if we're going to be using a metaverse to say enhance battlefield performance, we have to be thinking about how we can use it in a way where we can use it still under degraded conditions because it will be sabotaged. Right. Um, yeah. Jim, I think it's natural that you follow that. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, as an operator in the field with, uh, you know, you're obviously concerned about the connectivity and the integrity of uh, the data pipeline. Uh, it, if it's being used in a real world operational context. Um, so, so I assume you agree with what Jenny was saying about some of that. Anything else you would add either on that front or on just bigger picture, what are the security risks in your mind, uh, national security risks related to the metaverse? Okay, well, if I can just yeah. rephrase that, um, maybe not, um, what I'd like to talk about is not necessarily the risk, but the implications on national security that some of the, the implementation of some of these capabilities um, might mean for U.S. national defense. Uh, I mentioned how what the Army is doing to modernize our, our training, our legacy training architecture with a synthetic training environment. I mentioned that integrated digital augmentation system that soldiers will wear while conducting operations in the battle space. But we at Fort Leavenworth have been innovating just over the past year to look at this technology where it is now and what else can it do for us from a security perspective. And some of the insights that we've generated just in, I'd say about nine months of experimentation and research and, and just learning about the capabilities is what it can do in the field of educating our force. 
or what it can do for developing combat leaders throughout their careers. And then finally, what it can do for what, we, what in the Army we call mission command or what the Joint Force would call command and control. All of our military strategies are, uh, seem to suggest that, the, that we are at a precipice of a fundamental change in the character of war. That at a minimum, warfare over the next 20 years will be different from warfare over the last 50 years. And it's technology that's driving this change. So what we're seeing on this operational environment, this contemporary operational environment, is an expansion of that battlefield in ways that we could not have imagined, say, 30 or 40 years ago. That the battle space is becoming more contested, more lethal, more, connect, uh, more uh, interconnected from an information environment perspective. That we have five domains of warfare that are all stacked on each other. And then we have these complex, we have to deal on the battlefield with the complex interactions between humans and the information environment, as well as the physical terrain, weather, uh, day and night cycles and things like that. So the battle space is much, much more complex. So how do we visualize that battle space? How do commanders at Echelon do what they are required to do to be successful in combat, which is to drive the operations process? In order to do that, we, have, we the, the US Army and the US military, have to provide tools to our commanders at Echelon to be able to visualize, describe, understand, and direct forces on this very complex uh, battle space. These technologies enable us to better visual, visualize ourselves in this complexity, not just ourselves, but where we are in relation to units to our left and to our right. And the army never, the, the America never goes to war by, by, by itself. We always fight when we can as part of a multinational coalition with our constellation of allies and partners. So to be able to visualize those, those uh, friendly entities on the battle space, as well as the U.S. Joint Force. The Army does not fight alone. We fight as a cohesive joint force with the Air Force, Marines, now Space Force, the Navy, et cetera. To be able to synergize all of that combat power from national down to the tactical level would require tools that help us to better understand, communicate faster, to be able to visualize what's happening on the battle space, and then to act in a way that's faster to be able to decide faster, think faster, and show that cognitive agility to get that edge on whatever competitor that we're facing in the battle space. So I think it has tremendous, tremendous implications on national security. And the power of the technology, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. For those of you who may have participated in the demonstration that we've been providing over the last day and a half, you can see the power of these tools to generate rapid understanding and long-term, and have that understanding locked into your long-term memory. Where spatial com computing, I think, is gonna take us over the next 10 years is gonna fundamentally change the way that humans interact with the world. Just as the, the mobile computing revolution changed the way that we interact with the world. So it's very, very powerful. And uh, the future will, will you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball in the future, but I think your army is making some of the right investments and the right thinking on the application of this technology. Great, thanks, super helpful. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're going to turn to some audience questions. I'm gonna to go to Chris for the next question. Just picking up on what the Colonel was saying, you know, we have a very complex and evolving battlefield environment. I think that you know, the term battlefield is definitely evolving as far as the participants that we consider part of at least what, what a military and defense establishment, national security side needs to think about who they're influencing, who participates in this. Uh, a, a hallmark of the late 20th century and early 21st century was insurgency, that is non-uniform participants on the battlefield. And even more recently as of, um, you know, Russian activity to weaponize information and really convince civilian populations who have, in many cases, would otherwise have almost no connection to the battlefield, use them as, as pawns to shape um, state policy that's occurring and, uh, and spawn, uh, spawn, spawn separatist movements. Chris, I wanted to come to you, and, and I know, you, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but, you know, what does it mean in the metaverse? How is it evolving uh, the concept of citizenship, the way people might think about citizenship, and the way that some adversaries might want to use the metaverse to uh, shape um, public opinion uh, to their advantage when it comes to trying to achieve their national security goals. Could you comment on that? 
Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that. And a great discussion so, uh, so far. Um, I mean, you, you, this is where I wanted to go with the next question anyway. So thanks for that. Now, I think, um, you know, when you think about uh, human identity and what it means to have, you know, I think it's somewhat John touched on earlier, our human interactions with each other, with each other, and our human our interactions with others around us in society. How will that? What will that look like in the metaverse? And then how will that apply to our our real, you know, our, our life in reality? Um, and I've been I've been promoting for a while that we need more studies about how XR impacts groups and societies. All the studies so far have been done on individuals, but what does it mean for groups and societies, both inside the metaverse and outside of it? Because I think we need, we, we need to know what we don't know about that. So I see a lot of technologists talk about these things, but not a lot of sociologists. So that's one thing I'd like to see. I think when you look at how identity is exploited now, uh, you know, it, it gets, it's, I could, I, I work in disinformation, but the bottom, the big, you know, the bumper sticker for disinformation is that believing is belonging and belonging is believing. So part of believing a particular narrative means joining a particular group of people who have like my, have ideas and you, it gives you a group to connect with um, through cognitive closure. But what happens here is think about, for example, what the Russians have done in the Caucasus or in Ukraine prior to recently, or in the Baltics, they try to find people who are Russian speakers, really rile up their identity, and then try to get them to sort of separate like South Ossetia or Abkhazia and Georgia, places like that. Um, and one thing we exercised in our tabletop a few weeks ago was having someone try to do that in the metaverse. So how do you create a separate identity so that people identify with something other than their country, other than their community. So you can sort of attack their, you know, subvert their loyalty. And what would that look like? It's something we, it's, it's, a, it's been a tool of, of statecraft for years. It's been, a, you know, for, for ages. And I think it'll apply there as well. Uh, I think we're, you know, again, we're living in an age of the weaponization of everything. I always talk about hybrid threats or the weaponization of globalization. I think what the Russians are finding out now is that, you know, those tracers work both ways because the the global cyber effort coming back at them is, is pretty significant. Um, but to get to something Jim was talking about, I think what we're looking at today is that more connected spaces, but that also means more contested spaces. And in fact, connected spaces are contested spaces. You know, the information sphere, the, you know, uh, you know, and I, I'm a retired army myself, you know, I always used to say we operate where people live. So, um, you know, you can't do that in the water, but you do that on land. And so, what does that mean to be operating among people who, uh, on the one hand, may, you know, are living in, in different kinds of realities, different, you know, different versions of reality, and then our own forces. Let's not forget our own soldier, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardmen, they're going to be participating in this. Think about the opportunities to recruit them, to subvert them from their mission, to make them question orders and whatnot. Uh, we've seen the Russians doing that to the uh, enhanced forward presence for NATO and the Baltics for years. Hasn't been successful but they're always trying. So I think these are, and I think human identity, uh, what will that mean in the future? What will human community mean in the future? Spiritual belief, all of these things, I think um, we don't know what we don't know, but I think we need to start studying what it, how does this impact, how does this impact groups and society, both inside the metaverse and when people participate in the metaverse, how does their behavior in reality change? What kinds of discipline issues are you going to have? And if it's a first sergeant going to have fewer problems or more problems in the future? I don't know. But I think <laughs> first sergeant would probably say more problems. But I think these are all things that we need to look at uh, because at, at the end of the day, you know, we, we national defense may be about organizations, but it's people who do it. So very quickly, um, I think it might help if you all have a better understanding of how we might do things now so you understand why this makes a big difference. So you heard cyber information operations, disinformation come up a lot. Um, right now, when we integrate in cyber or information ops from a training standpoint, it's done with a white card typically. And this is a literal note card that's used to inject friction. So we're telling a warfighter, hey, your system's been sabotaged with this note card. So there's no realism within training. Um, Chris brought up a tabletop or a war game. When cyber information ops are brought into war games, oftentimes they are literally magic pixies us into that war game. Hey, uh, there's a cyber attack. We don't really have any fidelity or like real insight into what that might mean. So typically it's, oh, well, okay, this power plant's been sabotaged in the war game. Or hey, your cyber weapon definitely took out their nuclear installation. We don't have any like hard data behind that. So this is where things like 
metaverse modeling and sim really come into play because we're starting to get some insight where we can start to bring in some realism into war games into training events a synthetic environments that virtual and constructed environment that jim was talking about is the only place where you can actually train with fidelity for these types of multi-domain operations when it comes to war games we are just starting now to develop realistic civilian populations in war games where we're starting to model synthetic populations and bring them into war games we're just starting to now scrape data, looking at adversary information operations in real time, developing models of those information operations and seeing what they look like within simulations. All of these types of things that are just starting to happen are gonna be in these richer immersive environments. So it's this kind of step change, but it is really just occurring now and we need these environments to actually get there. I, I agree with that. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So I agree with Dr. Carver 100% that the, uh, the platforms and the systems that we've used to replicate the battle space are they're aging and the battle space is changing so quickly i mean it is, it's changing almost daily so this is why we do need these xr technologies to inject to create a uh, a simulated battlefield that actually replicates real life today as it is not real life 20 years ago how that battlefield looked like the word presence has come up again and again throughout this conference. And it applies here because we are trying to create these training scenarios where for the, in the army's use case, where the soldier feels like he or she is actually performing their combat responsibilities in a real world environment. Pulling these XR technologies in can add to that level of realism, can inject that sense of presence the uh, in the Army's modeling and simulation community, we have a saying that all but war is a simulation. So to improve the realism of our simulators through XR technologies, through creating a synthetic training environment, a uni unified training environment, to make it feel, feel uh, a soldier feel and experience the battlefield, short of actually getting shot at by people who hate them, is, uh, is absolutely ne necessary for our national defense and it is integral to the training strategies that we develop to build combat readiness. Great, great point. Um, let's see if we do some audience questions. I think you all need to wait for the, the mic to get to, but we'll start over here. Um, uh, about the multi-layer battlefield, let's say that I have the dominance on the data pipeline. I can have every single asset in the ground as a vector. And then I can have <laughs> everything work very fast. And I would be tempted to use AI to better fulfill the mission because no general will be able to think individual soldiers in the battlefield how to deploy faster enough. The question is, there is some doctrine being thought about it, how much you can allow that and how much you can restrain on that because to not, to, to not, to not open a Pandora box. Yes, yeah, so that's, this is a question I think that has been, that a lot of people in many circles are talking about is the, is the ethics of the employment of artificial intelligence into warfare. I think it is simply a fact, a fact that we all have to accept. That actors around the world will use increasingly as the as in the um, in our day to day lives and in commercial industries, as we have a greater and greater reliance on artificial intelligence uh, for day to day for everything that we do. Uh, the uh, we will find that parallel on the battle space where we have to use artificial intelligence to outsource some of the thinkings thinking that is necessary. This is already happening, and this has been happening for, for I don't know, four decades now. Uh, if you look at the F-35 Strike Eagle, this is the most incredible machine ever created by man, this, this incredible modern fighter. That, that plane is flown by a pilot, but it's also flown by multiple, essentially it's a supercomputer in, in the air. So there are ethical implications. We will work through those eth uh, ethical impl implications I think as long as you, the U.S. military continues to operate in the um, and perpetuate the values of our nation, 
operating under the rules of international law, be it the Geneva Conventions or any other rules of engagement, then, then the employment of AI in warfare is just another tool on the battle space. The adversaries in the future who fail to use artificial intelligence to some degree will, um, will, will, will not be successful in the battle space. And I think we are seeing this in Ukraine today with, with um, unmanned drones, the use of avoiding munitions, these modern technologies that are being employed in a way that we simply have not seen at this scale <coughs> because it's the first time they've been used. I hope that answers your question, sir. I want to give a chance to John, Chris, and Jenny just to comment on, on if they want to add anything and also maybe just to maybe uh, explain and expound upon the concept of human in the loop, this, you know, the doctrine that you know, generally you want humans to make this judgment, which the Colonel's touching on when we're talking about the Geneva Convention, but uh, human judgment on the battlefield too. If, if you guys want, otherwise we can move on to the next question. But John, you first, you first try refusal. Yeah, so you broke up a little bit there, but I, but I think generally the, I, the, the idea of um, how AI can enhance uh, some of our decision making on the battlefield and whether that's a moral decision or is that generally what that uh, topic was? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so it, it, in that process, um, you think of it, it, as we allow artificial intelligence to better understand our interactions on the battlefield and uh, our interactions with each other, leveraging XR to provide that AI an environment to learn and to explore based on context, right? Whether it's historical context, let me give that uh, spatial computing environment, uh, let that AI be inside that, observe and understand um, why somebody made a decision at a certain point when tactically, uh, per doctrine, that wouldn't have been a smart decision. And how can they pull that together with, you know, whatever reports came after the, after the battle that said, you know, these 12 people made these decisions were not, which weren't doctrine and needed to be made that way because there was just a moral implication to the end result of that battle. Um, allowing that AI to be inside the spatial context uh, to address, to learn, and to you know give uh, give decision makers something quickly to uh, think about, based not solely on doctrine, already understanding doctrine, but uh, taking other in implications into into account as well. Uh, Chris, anything to add on this question? Okay, Jenny, anything? Um, yeah, sure. So I think when we talk about, say, the use of AI in warfare, we need to remember that this isn't like a blanket, yes, please. It's going to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. So for instance, we're already using AI in projects like Project Maven, where we're using it for um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance purposes, where we're collecting a hell of a lot of imagery, a lot of video, and instead of having intelligence analysts sit in front of a computer all day watching this this, these videos, we have AI combing through that data. So we will constantly, the military will constantly be assessing what makes what makes the most sense for every single situation, um, whether they need to be, say, in the loop or on the loop, where we're in a sort of supervisory capacity. Um, also, you know, as uh, John said, you know, we will be we'll be using these simulated environments to kind of test out, test and evaluate these kind of applications to to make sure it makes sense from. Um, an ethical and a normative standpoint. We're also using it to kind of test out future concepts of operations. So there's this whole concept around the loyal wingman concept, whereby you have a fighter pilot, but his wingman is now an, um, an, is an unmanned system. So it, it will be used. It's just a question of how it will be used. And I think, you know, as a society, we can have a whole con conversation around what are we comfortable with from a normative standpoint. I will be the first to admit that you know, there have always been norms and conflict, places where countries do not want to go. You can go back to say World War I and look at the use of chemical warfare. That was, um, we were um, in World War II, we were normatively against the use of chemicals and warfare based on what happened in World War I. That got thrown out the door during conflict. So there's always a question of, we might say normatively that we are not comfortable with say AI making some kind of lethal decision, but you've got to ask yourself in conflict, at what point are those are those kind of normative barriers or constraints thrown away? 
Now, I'm not saying that we're going to do this in the military. It's just an open question to ask. And this is where war games are incredibly powerful. The more we can start to war game out these situations, put people in these very immersive kind of experiences where we can start to test those normative kind of barriers out and to see at what point do we actually start to throw those things away? That is very important data that we should really be thinking about, you know, kind of pulling at as a society. Great. Uh, we'll do, maybe, can we just read off maybe the next two questions in the room here? Uh, you first. So my experience is a little bit dated, but I know when we would talk about virtual training and synthetic training, one of the big um, areas of concern was negative training or kind of the lack of transferability in the skills that you developed in a virtual environment or a synthetic environment to the actual real world. They looked close enough that you kind of tricked yourself into thinking you had it. And then when you actually went out into theater or into the field, it didn't actually work the way that you expected it to. I imagine that would be even more of a challenge in a metaverse or a, right, an extended reality sort of situation. So how are you thinking about that and how are you mitigating against it? Okay, I, and if I may, I just saw one of the online questions is about uh, the ability for us to, to train those, which is any in line this question, transfer skills from the, the, um, the synthetic environment to the real operational environment, but also thinking about, are we thinking about the, the emotional impact on those involved in the battle space? I think was the, just to that middle question. So if I could add that into her question as well, and maybe go down the line, start with you, Colonel, on this. I think from the Army's perspective, we see virtual simulations as a tool on a continuum of training. It is one environment or one tool that you might use. And we don't want to do all of our training on a single tool because that it could lead to negative habits transfer, as you've described, where I am training solely on a simulator and the first time I get into that tank and start moving things around, I don't know what the heck is going on. We see it as a continuum of training where some of a soldier's training in a particular training glide path is done in virtual simulations. Some of it might be done in a constructive in simulation, a wargaming simulation. And then a portion of it must be done in the live uh, training. And that way you have this uh, a, a gradual building of skills that leads to some kind of capstone exercise that might be something that looks just like war short of being shot at with live bullets. So that's the continuum of training that we, that we try to establish. The more, the more uh, realistic our trainers are, um, we, we would assume the more form, fit, and function you have in a simulator, the better it is. But what we've kind of realized is there's actually a point of diminishing returns on, on our simulators. There's a point where the more you make it uh, perfect, the less benefit you get out of it. So there's that certain level that we have to kind of figure out. Now we've been talking about the use of these capabilities as all positive for soldiers in training or operations, but we also have to consider, and we are actively considering the vulnerabilities of these, of these things that we're putting on soldiers. There's a thing called cognitive overload. And we are now trying to figure out well, what is that level? And it's probably different for every soldier. I can think of as just a young, a young infantry platoon leader um, walking through, or as a, say a company commander in combat, for an infantry soldier to be moving through enemy territory, say in a dense um, jungle or woodland environment at night, carrying 130 pounds on his or her back with the fear of enemy uh, potentially attacking, it is already a pretty terrifying experience. Now I'm gonna throw this thing on my head that, so there's, there's a, there could be potentially a, a cognitive overload and we don't know what, that, what the optimal level of, of stress is and it's different for everyone. Now, stress is a good thing. There's that thing called flow where you, you wanna put a little bit of stress, but we are concerned about that. We're concerned about the, the fact that any electronics that you put onto an, a soldier or a vehicle in combat will, will emit a, a, a signature on the electromagnetic spectrum. And that militaries around the world and actors know how to find those signals and then target against them. We're seeing this quite a bit in Ukraine today. So how do you protect that? How do you protect it from cyber interference, jamming, spoofing, all of those things? This is a long-term problem and something that we're gonna continue to have to work on over time. John, Chris, or Jenny, anyone want to add to that answer? Yeah, um, when it when it comes to uh, you know this process of 
are we um, bringing in negative traits by providing something like a photo, very photorealistic environment uh, for a, a, an XR training application. And it doesn't look exactly, even though it's photorealistic, something's off, it doesn't look exactly like it does in the real world. The person goes out in the real world and then doesn't apply whatever that process or that, that tactic, technique and procedure is out there. We haven't seen it this way. What we've seen is that the opportunity to have more um, sessions uh, with more repetition with the TTPs that the, uh, that the user will need allows us then not to just drop them into, into their actual activity in the real world and that's it, but then to evaluate that against a live practical exercise leveraging that to kind of flesh out is that environment, is that training environment a, a capability that truly is enhancing and getting them to at least getting them to the point of the training that we need, the outcome that we've asked for. Um, that, how do we get there? We get there because we include instructional design specialists. We include the, at the very beginning, what, you know, what's the purpose for the, the application? And, um, and then you work out that possibility of any kind of negative traits in that but it does give an opportunity. Uh, we've had some people say, well, why, why don't I do the, a particular activity that we don't do in the real world except for an operational um, piece? We don't do because for safety reasons. And they say, okay, well, we could do that inside uh, XR or inside VR. The, the, often the issue isn't understood that, okay, if we do that, it's safety reason on the outside, why? Because there will be mental repercussions to the person um, in the real world. And you're only gonna take that risk in the real world for the actual operation, but trying to train that becomes problematic uh, if the same, if the feeling of presence is there with the, with the user and that learner. So their subconscious now is having to deal with that situation you provided them in training. And they don't think your subconscious isn't thinking of it as training, but it's thinking of they actually went through that. And so you have to deal with post-traumatic stress uh, issues associated with that training event. Um, so it depends. It depends on what's the outcome you're trying to get and what's the process you're using to do that. But I would say generally XR provides that opportunity to get more repetition and more opportunity for those training um, to observe, to make those adjustments before they go on to their live practical exercises. Great. Uh, for the next question, I'd like to go to the front row, the gentleman over our left. Hi, thanks. Um, I, earlier, someone mentioned that XR had the opportunity to, you know, improve or, or enhance or accelerate the acquisition process. So, so my question is, uh, do you see, you know, XR for both training and acquisition um, changing the focus from, um, you know, platform-based training to more kill chain-based. Can you just expand upon, just for the better for the audience, what you mean by platform-based versus kill chain-based? Yeah, so today, uh, you know, a lot of things are focused on uh, a platform, right? So let's say the, you know, the F-35, uh, and then you might be trained on you know, how to fly that or a specific uh, vehicle, right? Uh, manning uh, or operating on a piece of artillery rather than, um, you know, a, a specific uh, tactic or, uh, you know, a quote unquote, you know, a objective uh, in a battle space. Got it, okay. Jenny, do you wanna- Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take this. So um, I'm not, I wouldn't say just XR. I'd say the use of kind of synthetic environments to include XR. I do think there's a chance that it could allow us to move more in a way where we're focusing on the mission itself and the actual target versus say the platform. And I think you know part of this requires a broader paradigm shift in the way we train. I think we oftentimes focus on platform-based training. So you know, even if we have the tools at our disposal, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to shift towards say a kill chain-based model. However, 
I think we could get there. So for instance, there's these really interesting experiments right now that are ongoing where we're linking these cyber training environments to kinetic mission training programs. And for those that aren't aware of kinetic mission training, uh, mission training is like basically you're training the battlefield staff, the commanders, the ones that are going to command and control a mission. And oftentimes, say, cyber warriors are kind of divorced from that. Uh, cyber warriors aren't really training alongside non-kinetic war fighters. And when we think about, say, a future multi-domain fight, we want our cyber warriors, our non-kinetic war fighters, to be working hand in glove with our kinetic war fighters so that they together can get after that given mission set. And to in my mind, that is a kind of kill chain based approach to accomplishing a given mission. You are taking the best asset to accomplish that mission that you have on hand at a given time. Now for us to do that, we need to in, uh, increase those kind of training opportunities and very few exist. So right now, when you look at those kind of synthetic environments, they're very, very experimental. There's been some really interesting like s and science and technology experiments that have happened. So for instance, the um, Cyber Operational Architecture Training System, it's called the COATS Training System. It was actually used as an experiment at Ultra Freedom Guardian. It's one of the biggest kind of exercises that happens in the Indo Pacific and um, um, to kind of test out what this would look like, where the, the battle staff could actually start drawing on, say, cyber warriors when they're trying to figure out how to command and control their forces. That was fundamentally unique. Um, we're still trying to figure out ways to like integrate that more into like exercises and training events. I think the more that you see that kind of stuff developing, the more we can start to then create that kind of paradigm shift in training where we could get after that kind of problem. That's great. That's yeah, that's a great answer, I think. Uh, and I'll hit the acquisition piece of this in terms of acquisition modernization and how do we more rapidly uh, procure things that we need in the battle space. And of course, the, all of the services are going through a process to modernize our acquisition uh, our acquisition architecture, how we how we get after the material that's needed by, by the force. Previously, up until recently, we have gone through a, a requirements generation process where the army says, we need this capability to do these five things for soldiers. And then we generate a requirements document, several hundred page document, and then we hand that to industry and industry bids on the ability to do that. But in this ever-changing battle space where we need to innovate and acquire things that don't even exist yet faster and faster, what we found in just a little bit of experimentation we've done is that rather than telling, you can show, put headsets onto decision makers, members of Congress, uh, um, leaders, and rather than describing using, you know, uh, say, PowerPoint slides or a document or Excel spreadsheets, you can simply animate and show them. And we found that, that you can take some very, very complex uh, uh, ideas and, and display them in XR that are extremely powerful. You know, if a picture tells a thousand words, then what does a moving, kind of living, breathing avatar or, or hologram in XR, what, how many words does that tell? And it's very, very powerful. So it's a great way to communicate our own requirements to leadership great way to communicate our requirements to our industry partners across, across the globe on the things that we actually need, why we need them, what they may look like, and things like that. Thanks, Carl. Adam, for our, our last question. Hi. Um, this question is for Chris. Um, you mentioned uh, this briefly about the tabletop exercise that you recently took part of. Uh, in, could you please expand on what that involved and also some of the lessons learned from that experience? Uh, sure. Well, our report will be coming out soon, so I don't want to, um, I can't really read the whole thing off. We don't have time. But the first, the, the big, when it came to a couple things, the first one is that, uh, you know, how many years in it, how many years out can you take your political leadership to look at a problem? You know, in most cases, you can go one or two years out. We try to take them out eight years, really hard to do, as other folks in the room probably know. Um, it's, it's a bit of a jump for them or even for their senior technical staff. It's, it's a tough jump. So I think that's one of the big challenges. How do you uh, how do you keep very senior political leaders and their staffs sort of uh, how, how can they be up to speed and be able to respond uh, and with legislation, with policies that are relevant and in time. 
Uh, you know, democratic processes work very slowly. They take time. So that, that's, that's a big, one big challenge. The other one that I mentioned earlier, uh, and that is a matter of governance, you know, governance in the metaverse. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of some of the political leaders, I even had a former NATO sec gen in our, in our uh, exercise. And, you know, one of the things he mentioned was, you know, this looks sort of like the, the age of exploration where, uh, you know, sailing to for, far away seas and claiming, you know, new lands or creating new, la new, new, um, new territory. Uh, you know, we have uh, real estate being sold in the metaverse. So you have, Barbados has an embassy there. The city of Seoul, you can pay your water bill or you can file for divorce in the metaverse. So there's a lot of activities. There's a lot of government, you know, things happening in there. And I think it's important for us to remember if we take, if this, since this is a national security discussion, I think if we think about how many of our security challenges in the last 20 years came from, originated from ungoverned and undergoverned spaces. And so this really, I think, requires a national and global effort, because think if you think about it, an ally or partner or, or a nation that's important to us that does not govern their metaverse well, it could create instability that would Im could impact U.S. national interests. So I think in a, broad, in, a, in a broad sense, it's not just for us to govern it, but for us to encourage our allies, partners, and nations around the world to govern this as well. Great. Uh, we've reached the end of the time that we've allotted, unfortunately. I'm sure we could go on for much longer, but I would ask everyone to please join me in thanking our excellent panel of experts.